We're at the IS meeting 2018 in Amsterdam, and we're here with Jose Zaniga, who is president of IPAC, and just completed a survey that you do, you've do, you been doing in conjunction with uh, Gilead, uh, and did that in June with 24,000 respondents. That's terrific. And I, I want you to, first of all, give us a sense of what this survey does, what it's designed to do. So we were pleased to partner with Gilead Sciences as the core technical partner of the Fast Track Cities Initiative. It's a network of 250 cities around the world accelerating the local AIDS responses. The survey is HIV sorted. It is meant to gain a sense of what the general public believes about HIV, their attitudes about people living with HIV, as in, and as important, whether they feel that they're at risk for it and if they are taking advantage of or utilizing uh, prevention interventions. Mm -hmm. And what was the, uh, where did you do the survey? Is it uh, done in urban or suburban or, or did you specifically pick out different areas? The survey was conducted in 12 countries and in nine of those countries we have uh, fast track cities. In the mm -hmm. remaining countries we uh, have fast track cities will be on board by the end of the year. They're, they were all in Europe, uh, at least the data we released uh, today, mm -hmm. and um, that include both Western and Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And the data that you have now is, is just being looked at and evaluated and uh, will be formalized and you'll come out with modeling or whatever it is down the line. But right now, can you tell us a, a sense of, of what you've been able to see? Sure. So the survey was conducted in June, so not a lot of time between right. June and, and this conference here in July to unpack the data. Mm -hmm. But these, these data across these 12 countries uh, will be released to our fast track cities as well as to other stakeholders within the countries where the survey was conducted to help influence some of the decision making around for example awareness campaigns uh, related to HIV in general, um, HIV treatment mm -hmm. literacy, mm -hmm. and that's important whether people are taking advantage of HIV interventions that we have pl in place including mm -hmm. condoms and combination prevention. What we found in, this, in the initial cut of the data uh, was alarming in some respects in that there are still perceptions of people living with HIV that uh, you would think would have been dissipated 37 years of the epidemic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. including a belief that people living with HIV AIDS should not be employed in certain professions. A high percentage of, mm -hmm. of, of respondents indicated people living with mm -hmm. HIV AIDS should not work in, in hospitals, in clinics, mm -hmm. in restaurants, in cafes, in universities. And so that was alarming to us and indicates that tremendous more work needs to be done to educate mm -hmm. the general public about where we stand in the mm -hmm. science of mm -hmm. HIV and undetectable, equal, and untransmittable, all these amazing public health successes that we've achieved over these many years. Because it just pushes it underground. It, it just, does. Yeah. And, it, it, and it further stigmatizes it. It's just, it's just un surreal that we have this episode every spring that every season. Sure. Mosquitoes, they're going to transmit the virus. Uh, what were some of the others? Oh, doctors, like we're saying, doctors, uh, dentists, mm -hmm. we're saying, I don't treat people who are HIV. Sure. I said, how do you know? <laughs> sure. And it's, that, that's it's, worrisome. Uh, it's crazy. I mean, it's worrisome because, it, especially as HIV care and prevention services are transitioned from specialists, HIV specialists, to primary care providers, we could face mm -hmm. a circumstance where people are being denied access to life-saving mm -hmm. medications, mm -hmm. prevention interventions that work. Mm -hmm. But also alarming out of the out of the survey and the stigma front was 68% of respondents say they would, they would feel uncomfortable dating someone living with HIV. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that speaks to a general ignorance. But actually, that's of where the, we the opposite of what the reality is, because Correct. people who are dating other people, discordant couples. Mm -hmm are more likely not to transmit the disease than people out there having casual, unprotected sex. Absolutely. This is obviously, that's the dynamic that somehow or other people are reading their own uh, science or something, building their own science, because it is, it's, um, it, it just, like you say, it continues to be way back 30 years ago. It just, it doesn't make sense. In some respects, yes. Uh, but encouraging out of the survey was we found that there's still a sense that government should be investing in the HIV response across all of mm -hmm. all of Europe, including Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. and, a, and a sense that HIV is not under control, mm -hmm. which is, is true. I mean, in, in essence, given these, mm -hmm. uh, these stigmatizing thoughts about people living with HIV, given that individuals are not literate about where we stand in 2018 uh, by, uh, in relation to U equal U and so many other, other uh, mm -hmm. successful uh, interventions we have in place, it's not surprising that we're not 
having epidemics under mm -hmm. control, particularly in Eastern Europe, where we're also facing criminalization of, of, of homosexuals and many other structural barriers that mm -hmm. prevent us from controlling the epidemic. One other thing you mentioned at the end of the, conf uh, the end of that press conference was the uh, the thought that a lot of the organizations that were there from the beginning supportively and are not really as supportive as they were then, and they need to be ever ever more so today. The ones that were logical, a lot of the gay and lesbian organizations and so forth. Uh, I mean, everybody, all hands on deck. Uh, was it you that said I that? I said that. Yes, yes I think and so. I believe it. Yeah. As a gay man, I, mm -hmm. I was proud of the response mm -hmm. that the that the gay community mounted in the early days of the epidemic. Mm -hmm. Without that, so many people would have died with, with lack, complete lack of dignity mm -hmm. um, and the support services that, that they required just to, to live mm -hmm. uh, with dignity and HIV would not have been there. Mm -hmm. um, the advocacy that this community mounted to get drug approval faster, to get drugs mm -hmm. into, the, into the mouths of people would not have happened without this robust mm -hmm. advocacy. Regrettably, I haven't seen that across the board um, in, in globally now, and it needs to be a priority again for LGBT organizations recognizing that they have an important role to play alongside everyone else to end the epidemic. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other thing is I knew many years ago when we had a lot of people were overwhelmed by the disease, they would have bars that they said they didn't want any posters up that were HIV and all that stuff. I understand a safe space from, from the drama, but the fact was that everyone there was was trying to live a life different and i think when we look at it it's so important for everyone to just normalize i hate to use the term normalize uh, it's still an exceptional disease in that it can be treated but it's 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 um, it, it 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 is so important to get treated and if we don't have the people recognize it or in denial we're we're killing the ability to to end this disease absolutely i i think the U equal U message goes a long way towards that normalization, and if we can mm -hmm. promote that message amongst the general public as much as we need to within our own community, because mm -hmm. we still have docs who are unwilling to say it to their patients, we still have patients who don't believe it, mm -hmm. but the more we, we are able to promote that message, I think we can normalize HIV to such a degree mm -hmm. that people can, can view it as something that can be controlled um, and, and no longer be as afraid of it as they have been mm -hmm. for the last three decades. Right. We're at a different place today. It, it's an exciting place to be, and I would hope that that excitement would permeate into the general public. The fact that it hasn't means we have a lot of work to do. It's, to it's, so, it's so treatable. Absolutely. It's so treatable, and, and I don't use, again, another word, innocuous to drugs. They, there is a little side effect here and there, but, but for the most part, compared to Norvir and uh, other <laughs> drugs that you had to take on time precisely and all this sort of thing, they're very friendly drugs these days. It's treatable and it's yeah. preventable. Right. When we, we have both treatment as prevention right. and by combination prevention that works. Right. And so the, our ability to communicate that to people and, mm -hmm. and, and increase that literacy I think will be extremely helpful. Right. Well, I really much appreciate your taking the time to visit with us and I hope that uh, the campaign and the evidence that you present will be listened to strongly by the people that are out there that are needing to make the difference in the government and in the organizations and in the population. Thank you very much. Thank I you. I appreciate it. Appreciate it.